Yeah, all right, we're going on now. Come on. Cool, I'll just test this is working and then we'll go from there. All right, team, we should be going live now. Let me know if you can see this in the group. Uh, just chuck a comment, a couple of likes on there and see if we're good to go. And then we'll get underway. I believe we should be all good. Cool, we just make sure we can hear everyone and we're, we're all linked up in the group and we'll go. Sounds good. Cool, as far as I know, we're good. Um, try, you put all the technology in one room and you want to make sure it works, right? I've done this before and literally been like talking for 20 minutes and like, all right, couldn't hear me. Easy, no, we are good. Cool, man, so we're going live. I want to make sure that we, as we mentioned before, it's just kind of get really clear on, on obviously both of us are you know, PTs in the industry working with, with clients and really making sure that uh, we're, we're making a difference, right? And, and we're not just there to count reps, we're not there to just, um, I don't know, be there for, for the time. And there's so many people who get stuck in, stuck in that situation of just wanting to tick off the hours. It's good money, but I don't have, to do, don't have to do anything. And really, I think there's a bit more there for you. So I want to start before we kind of dive into some concepts that people can go away with. Uh, ultimately, where, where you started from, what sort of process you went through. And um, I, I saw a really cool story that obviously it sounded like you started from even being the, the janitor or the cleaner of these mills and kind of worked through that process and, and it brought, brought yourself right up to level three now, which is, is the top rung in the Les Mills. So um, if you want to go right down that and tell, tell the guys uh, who you are and what you do. Uh, so, hey team, uh, my name's Nikki. I've been working at Les Mills now for six years. Um, as Ollie said, kind of started at the bottom. Uh, I needed a job when I was studying. Um, sadly, I wasn't qualified enough to jump straight into like gym floor and helping people. So I kind of had to start um, right at the bottom, got offered a janitor role. So cleaning nights, two hours, two hours a day, four days a week. So money wasn't great, but for me, the main thing was getting that foot in the door and starting out. Once I completed, I did a bachelor's degree up at um, Massey, studied health science, majoring in sports and exercise. Um, so I really enjoyed kind of the science side of training and fitness and health and all that sort of stuff. So that's kind of the real big one that drew me towards that. Um, and then, yeah, once I kind of got the qualifications behind me, jumped on the gym floor at Les Mills, did that for about two and a half years. And then finally got to a point where I was kind of quali qualified enough to make that jump into PT. So that was back in, in where we're we now, 2020. So about four and a half, four, a little bit years ago. And haven't looked back since, kind of slowly built my business up from people that I knew from the floor, getting lucky with a few leads and things. But then from there, kind of built that reputation behind me where before you know it, people contacting you rather than you having to find the business. And then from there, it's just been ball rolling. Maybe my biggest year last year, and it's just gone up and up and up from there. Brilliant, man. I, reason, I imagine the biggest reason for that is, you know, you started off with that, that goal of really uh, – getting to a high level, really working your way through it. But what you didn't lose through that process is making sure you were constantly learning and making sure that you're adapting from your environment, you were, you were taking up information from people you respected and, and were really allowed that. So I imagine that was a big part of your growth through there, yeah? Yeah, for sure. I'd, I'd say probably the most learning I did was actually being in the industry itself. Hmm. You know, like having that degree behind me gave me a good platform to be able to kind of learn to how to take that information, how to actually apply it. And then from there, it was going cool. Like whenever someone says something to you, okay, well, I know enough about science and things to go, okay, well, is this you know, BS? Or actually, is there some truth behind it? Mm. So I'm really grateful for having that uni background. It's allowed me to do that. Um, but yeah, most of my learnings just come from, you know, doing. Yeah, cool. And, and with your, with the, you know, now that you've been on in there, you know, doing the PT for four years now and really learning through that process, working with a lot of different clients, you said there's a good breadth of the people you're working with. What do you reckon, and this is really diving in at the deep end, but I'm interesting to know what your, your main overview on this is, is what do you think 
is really holding people way uh, back from getting back in great shape or the general goals they have with training? What's the main thing you think people uh, really struggle with or the main obstacle is there? Uh, biggest one is, you know, it's hard. It's really hard to get kind of back in or to either change your routine, get back into a routine. You know, it takes effort. Yeah. And, you know, even, what, two weeks after New Year's, you know, people just trying to get themselves back into the gym. You know, it's only two weeks since Christmas or whatever, you know, since they've had that time off. And straight away, they're just like, oh, don't want to be back here. Or, you know, the reason why I'm paying you money is because I need to be here, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And everyone's still looking. And it's something I would imagine you'd see as well is, and I've made it very clear with people I work with is, you know, they pay you the money to, to get in shape. I'm like, dude, that's just showing me that you have commitment to do this. You're still going to do the fucking work, you know, and it's not just paying for that next red bu red, red button or the, the next supplement or pill that's going to get you there. You've still got to show up and then really being, being able to invest in the coach and everything else there is not making any of this easier. What it's doing is giving you a path and making sure the direction you do put in is really starting to move you forward, right? So yeah, that, that big idea and you did a video obviously the other day, it's, there's no silver bullet. There's no way of just, um, sitting back and getting it done for you, you're still going to put those hours in. Yeah, yeah. And that's the thing, like, it is, there isn't, we're not luckily enough, funny, you know, the amount of information out there, you'd think they would have found something by now, but the truth is there's not. There's no single thing that an individual can do that's actually going to get them to where they want to be the fastest. Like, they've got to put in the time, they've got to put in the effort, they've got to learn, you know. Um, it's yeah. like anything, even outside of the gym, you know, people have jobs where they're constantly having to either adapt or learn new things because times are changing. It's the same with the fitness industry. You know, the stuff that I learned when I was, you know, at uni is not redundant, but it's a little bit more out of date, you know? Yeah. yeah. I look back to the concepts you brought in and you see it with everyone, right? They learn one thing like this is the only way, but you start to realize, and I was very much guilty of this myself, but you start to learn how many different ways you can get there and why why they're there right because as long as you're putting that work in you've got the commitment to show up that's half of it but now we can put some direction behind that there's obviously some being logical about what's going to move you forward the most to make sure we're working with your body so you're not damaging shit but it's making sure that there's there's no best way and there's no one way um, but if we can really get you there moving forward and, and seeing those results then ultimately that allows you to show up and have that that loop that's playing back uh, knowing you want to do it and knowing that you can see it now yeah, and this is the thing, like everything's an experiment. You know, it's either going to work for you or it's going to work against or it's going to keep you where you are. Yeah. And it's just taking that data in and going, cool, when I did this, this was the result. Was it positive, negative, or did I say neutral? And then you would just adapt around that. Yeah. And that's the thing. Some people are lucky. They hit the nail on the head straight away and they go, cool, this is the way it's done. You know, yeah. I did this one thing and it got me to here. And someone else would do it and be like, I didn't get the same results. And that's yeah, yeah. And tell me, how, how long do you usually train with a client? What's a, an average sort of time you, you've trained with someone? Uh, 45 minutes, roughly, give or take. Cool. Um, and, uh, so, like, how long do they stay with you for, as, since they've signed up with you? How long do, does a usual uh, client stick around? Uh, upwards of six months. Yeah. Yeah, and, and really that's a big one, I think, is, is seeing someone or at least committing to that process. Uh, and imagine by now you're looking at like, I'm not working with you unless you're putting three months down or you're able to commit to that time, right? Because you need six months in order to actually get a difference in gene expression, right? Like there needs to be a level from a science level, you know this, right? Is making sure that there needs to be adaptations, obviously in habits, but also at a gene level needs to change, the gut needs to change in order to be able to solidify this stuff to make sure that you're not just going to go back to where you were. And if you're following a diet for six weeks, eight weeks, you drop a lot of weight, the weight, that's great. But that's why people were dieting three times a year and ending up heavier than they were when they started, right? You need to put that consistency in. You need to find some way to check in with someone. And then it's just sticking to that, having the commitment to stick to that. And what investment that takes for you or way to invest time, money, or energy to keep that on track. That's really what gets you forward. Well, yeah, and then, then that does come down to what their ultimate goal is. Like if someone's trying to get ready for a wedding, then sure, yeah, you can teach them, here's a restrictive eight-week diet, you know, go nuts sort of thing. But then if it's long-term things, the plan has to be long-term as well. It's like, yeah. um, you know, it's like, again, back to that magic bullet. It's not just going to happen straight away, you know, just the same as we don't become fat overnight, you know. It's a process, right? It's the yeah. same with the other way. And that's yeah, so with, with getting these clients in shape, seeing that process there, what do you, what would you say is your non-negotiables that really when the client comes to you and you want to get some something moving forward there, what, what are the things you really make sure are clear when you start training with someone? 
Uh, pretty much the big one is stuff outside the gym. You know, that's where the biggest change is going to happen. Yeah. So that kind of trying to implement techniques and strategies for people outside the gym, you know, because I can control what they do inside, but it's the outside. So it's trying to educate them more about what they can do first outside of the gym, right? Because then from there, they're going to learn from me in the gym of what they can and can't do and all that sort of stuff. Yeah, yeah. The big one is true. And I really, really like that you say that because, you know, that's something that when you're in a, you're a PT in a gym, so many people just think about the hour and then they forget about you until next week when you turn up again. And if you start to see that difference and start to see how much, you know, you're not in control of the 23 hours that they're not in the gym with you. It's ultimately yeah. such a big difference. And if you, you're focusing on that already, you're, you're ahead of so many PTs and so much uh, focus of this industry, right? And just go, go, go. How can we get more done? But if you're not looking at that recovery aspect, how to really feel healthy and, and feel good first, none of that stuff in the gym is really going to get you out of that hole you've dug for yourself. Well, that's the thing, right? Like if you're sitting down in the morning, having breakfast, you're driving a car to work, you're sitting down at work, you know, drive a car back home, you're sitting in front of a couch. Somewhere in that day, you do an hour's worth of exercise. That one hour is not going to undo everything that you've just done. Yeah. And that's the big thing. It's just like, cool, yeah, we can do as much as we want in the gym, but if you're just going to go home and be a sloth, mm. you know, we're not going to make progress from that. Yeah. Cool. That's the, the, main, the main non-negotiable there is a little bit more awareness around uh, eating, eating habits, or is it just active movement, or what do you usually suggest? Well, for me, the two are kind of synonymous, like they go together really well, Absolutely. but it's coming down to some people know what they should be eating, right? And that's the one that's going to take a little bit longer, but if we can start with something small just by trying to increase the amount of movement throughout the day, whether it's walking to work and all that sort of stuff, then that's a key thing to start with, right? That's an easier topic to have straight off the cuff, you know, I mean, because in terms of like the nutrition stuff, it's all habits as well, you know, so it's going to take some time to understand your client and then get them to understand themselves and what they need to be reporting back to you. Sure. And what's one of the biggest things that you say to clients that allow them to just open up a lot of this? Because for me personally, I find it's awareness, right? They think they know, they, they're like, yeah, yeah, I know how to do this. I know how to do that. I'm like, great. Why are you not doing it? You know, there's, there's an aspect of like limitation because they think they know what they they are all, uh, what they're doing or what they should be doing. It's just a case of doing it. I'm like, great. Well, then we've already found our first limitation is action. And like you said, it's hard. Sure, it's hard, but you, you know what to do apparently, but it's how do you get to that goal? So it's never more information that gets you there. It's what can we change in order to really get action out of them? And, and do you have any sort of ways that you've taught the clients or, or made that shift in order to be like, great, you know what these things are. Why are we not doing them or how to, to make that a little bit more consistent? Yeah, that's one I'm like really starting to develop at the moment. And the big one is just jotting down what they're already doing. Yeah, absolutely. Because um, then you can see in front of them on a piece of paper, where are my gaps, right? If it's food, they can see from their food diaries, like, oh, shit, I haven't had a piece of fruit in like three weeks. Mm. You know, the movement stuff, they're like, oh, cool. Like I'm doing one hour of training throughout the day, but then for the rest of the day or whatever, there's nothing. <laughs> So for them themselves, they can make that association between, okay, I'm not getting somewhere because there are these gaps that I need to start looking into. And then yeah. the, my job is to help give them strategies to fill in those gaps. Yeah, yeah. Now that's big. And, and you know, coming from a science background, I was wondering where you'd go there, but it's you start to realize how much further you get once you have them jotting down what they're doing and, and they start to just see awareness from that, right? Like if you start speaking out loud, you realize what your thoughts really mean. Same thing with when you write down your foods and everything, you start to really understand where those gaps are. And it's just this whole nother level of awareness. And you know, I've gone down a path of, you know, a lot of PTs at a high level try to do blood tests and try to get all these these complicated and expensive tests done in order to to find stuff that you could have found just from being a little bit more aware with your daily habits and just being able to see that written down, be able to just basic food plans, all the stuff that doesn't sound sexy, but really puts you in a spot that really opens the door to, to awareness and being able to build a habit that will last and really serve you long term. Yeah, yeah. And that's the thing. It's the big key there is the awareness. A lot of people, you ask them, well, what did you have for lunch? They can't tell you what they had for lunch. Yeah, they just you know, it's like an around Right, because it's just a thing that they do. They don't take in, you know, they're not focusing on the food that they're putting in. And that's the thing, is like it's the small bits that add up. Um, you know, it's all those unconscious things that we do, those habits, right? When it becomes a habit, it just becomes unconscious. So you just do 
Yeah, yeah. And that same unconscious thing, right? You see it when people are, are driving home, you think about how scary that is with 90% of your habits being unconscious. And then that road changes and they're like, oh shit, I didn't even realize that half the way home, I'm not even thinking about it. And being able to see that shame shift in your foods, if you're just relying on something to be there at, at lunchtime for you, you're just going to choose whatever you have in that 20 minute block to go run out and buy and come back or even worse, sit at your desk and eat it. And, you know, we've all been there, but trying to make sure that we can set up some standard of being able to prepare something or aware of what are our better choices at least and being able to know that we can have those scheduled in and we have a time that just stops us from being tripped up right yeah yeah and the big one there is also planning forward like we always look back and go okay based on what i've eaten today then you know this but then we also got to think ahead it was like okay well if i've got this event coming up where i know i'm going to be either overeating over drinking whatever you know we can still have those good things in our life that we enjoy but then it's kind of cool if that's going to happen then what changes do i need to make now that allow me to either not get any too much negative effect from what's coming up you know and that's a big one as well is that forward planning you know i try to encourage as much as possible as getting clients not necessarily to prep their food because a lot of the clients like fresh you know cooking but then planning out the meals that they're going to have mm. Right, rather than cooking the stuff straight away, be like, okay, tomorrow night I'm going to make this, this, and this. And then during the end of the week, I'm going to make that. And then it's just getting them thinking more, right? Because the more they start thinking about it, the more they become aware of it, and they're willing to make that change. Um, yeah. Uh, so, so when, you're, when you're able to plan that stuff out and, and people were just coming in with this complete, complete like, unconscious habits right everything that's just sabotaging their ability to improve and you start to write this out you start to see that on paper what's the biggest thing would you say it's being just that stuff at lunchtime that they're eating what would you say the main thing that you you start to look at first it's um for me it's the big ones over the course of the week it's not necessarily individual meals because a lot of people actually know they actually eat relatively well Mm -hmm. You know, um, but it's just either portion sizes, how much they're having. Um, I had one client who was, you know, she told me that she was having, you know, some some protein, some broccoli, and then some rice for lunch. I was like, cool, well, what sort of rice are you having? She was having the, one of those big Uncle Ben bags of rice. And I'm like, are you aware that those are two servings in one bag? Yeah. And she said, yeah. so then my first thing was like, cool, that's one area that we just need to focus on. Right, rather than trying to figure out everything else, like let's just focus on this little bit here first. Mm-hmm. And lunch is definitely the harder one for yeah. you know, being at work, not a lot of people have a full kitchen available to them. You know, most people were still stuck in that work route of being like, Oh, I've got a meeting pre-lunch, I've got a meeting after lunch, I need time to prep for those things. Yeah. So then they put the food at the back of the priority list. Yeah. And so they just grab a snack or this or whatever, not realizing that it actually has snacks at morning tea, they have snacks at after the lunch, you know, that sort of thing. Yeah, yeah. That, that's a good one. Cool. So you, you have an idea, obviously, that's a big one, just the awareness around food, finding habits that are more conscious, you're making the decisions, but also you're aware of con- con- consciously of the portion sizes you're having, because it's not just uh, eating good food. If you're still eating a ton of food, you're still in an excess of calories at some levels, right? So, from a food standpoint, a really great base, making sure you're eating good quality foods, but then awareness of how much you're eating and, and when you're eating, potentially uh, in what state you're eating them, right? So, if you're stressed out and you're going for food because it's allowing a, a um, it's it's sort of a, again, it's an unconscious habit because you're stressed, right? So you go have that pizza because you're thinking it's going to make you feel better, and it's this this constant habit of just sabotaging potentially your progress of the weekend because now it's Friday and this is where I go through a pack of beer or this is where I go through a pizza because it's just a way of you relieving that and I think it's something that I've talked about a lot and ingraining habits that you know you're as you're a kid you may have been crying or upset or whatever and your parents could have given you food to just shut you up and make you better right so this is ingrained with you throughout your childhood and throughout your adulthood because as soon as shit gets hard as soon as you find there's a level of stress or whatever else in your life, break up, whatever, you now find those external influences to make you feel better. So whether that be drugs, that be food, alcohol, that just is always the biggest factor that when you start to put those down on paper and you're like, why do I do that every Friday? Oh yeah, it's because I have a boss. You start to really have a massive understanding of why these habits are here and how much it's holding you back. Yeah, yeah. And this is one, one area I know people kind of, they don't connect the two dots, it's especially that environmental Right, the environmental factor, the social factor. Yeah. Um, 
especially when it comes to eating, you know, they don't make the connection that, okay, well, when I feel like this or when I'm in this situation, this is what I do. And that's where it comes back again, always back to that awareness of going, cool, well, if I'm putting myself into this situation, then I'm always setting myself up to fail. Absolutely, yeah. And Christmas is a great example of that, right? Like you think that people in great shape, you think of people at the top, uh, guys that uh, have a whole new level of discipline, this whole level of willpower, you think it is. And ultimately, at the end of the day, if, if I'm going to go to Christmas, I'm going to eat the food. You know, there's no extra willpower that I have to, to stay in shape. It's just when I'm at home, and I, I don't have that food in my house. And if I'm that hungry that I have to go out and get it, great, I'll have it. But it's making sure that in, in your day-to-day -day life, you're trying to find a way to limit that or just be smarter about what you have in the house so you're not just going into that cupboard. And even, so, you know, so many people look at, tell me, and, and they say, I was looking at myself in third person. I mean, why are you eating that cookie? You know, and you're just doing it because it's out of habit or it's in the fridge or whatever else that, that just gets in your way. And, and it's all found when you look at that awareness factor, right? Yeah. And that's the thing. Like, you always have to look back at yourself. It's like, why am I doing what I am doing? Right? Mm -hmm. What is your why? Yeah. And <clears throat> like the food habits and, you know, if your goal is just general well-being, then you don't obviously have to be as strict. Mm. But um, if you have a really specific goal that you're trying to get to, then every choice that you make has to be hitting you in that right direction. So every time you have a mouthful of food, food you know, it's like, is this too much for me at the moment? Or is this actually helping actually going to be better for me? Yeah, absolutely. You know? I think it's an important point to bring in. Like, there's no point living your life like you've got a competition around the corner every week. Like, there needs to be a factor of well-being and being able to still move forward in that process. And if you're having to get ready for a show or a, a competition or a photo shoot, then great, do that thing. But um, you've got to realize that long-term for longevity and enjoying this process and still being able to feel good in your own skin, it doesn't come from being ripped in six-pack abs. It comes from having habits that allow you to move forward and still enjoy stuff you want to enjoy, right? So, you know, a big thing for me is trying to make sure that we're not just a little, there's, there's times where if you feel like it's holding you back from going to those social occasions or being in a position that uh, you want to be in, we're still allowing that to be there. But throughout the week, you're able to put those decisions in place that mean that you don't fall off on the weekend. And if that means that you're aware of how many drinks you're having on that night, night maybe going a lower percentage alcohol, and you're not just getting to the weekend and thinking of that as a way of leaving the week behind and leaving that stress behind and potentially managing that throughout the week, you tend to look at those weekend scenarios a lot better and enjoy them more. Yeah, exactly. And that's the thing. At the end of the day, we're only on this planet for a short amount of time. Mm. You know, so you've got to enjoy everything. And when it comes to health, health isn't always about restricting yourself, right? Mm. Yes, we have an abundance of food, but none of that food is inherently bad for us, yeah. right? It's always the amount that you have, right? So if you want to go out on the weekend and have some drinks with your mate, go out and have some drinks with your mate. Just don't overdo it. Yeah. And if you're going to have food and drinks, then be aware of the food choices that you're going to make. Absolutely. And how much do you think that yourself, uh, that mindset plays into that? Do you, do you go into any sort of meditation or uh, awareness of, of sort of their mindset on those? How, how deep do you usually go? At second practice, you know, even for you probably experience the same thing, but whenever you look at a client, you also then look at yourself and be like, oh, I'm telling them these things, but do I do those as well? I mean, so especially from probably after the first six months of my own kind of PT life, it's taking the experiences from my clients, but then also looking at what I was doing and then being cool. If I'm teaching my clients about this awareness around food, then I also have to be doing that. Yep. <laughs> Obviously, over the first few weeks, it becomes quite tough, but then it's just practice, 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 like the little bits of doing. And then it's trying to get your clients to do the same thing, which then obviously the hard part because you can't control them. But if you can relate to them on some level and be like, hey, this is what's worked for me, potentially it could work for you as well. And it's just giving them a chance to go, okay, well, you're not a superhuman. You know, you've been through these same struggles. I'm going to be more willing to give these things a go. Yeah. Yeah. And I think there's two really valuable points there. Is one is making sure that you're not just telling them what to do and it's not taking away things. So it's that idea of what can we shift and allow it to be a progress to feel like you're moving forward rather than just constantly taking things away. But second is all is making sure that you're in a position that you're, you're speaking for example, you're, you'll be able to relate to them directly because you're aware of how you're showing up as yourself and, and how that portrays with your clients. And you know, you're going through that same, same process. You know, a lot of uh, my clients at, at times have been like, they put you on a pedestal and be like, Oh, well, you're a PT or you're this person. I'm like, no, I'm just, 
able to be aware of these are the things that get me bored and this is the person I need to show up to to be as, as a PT and to be a leader of the, this group of people, then I need to be able to have these same standards myself, right? So you're going into it with a level of humility, but you're going into it with a level of uh, awareness of where they're at as well. Yeah, and this thing, like if you can't practice something yourself, then how are you supposed to then pass it on to your client? Mm. You know, um, like I, to be honest, like I'm never going to train anybody for a bodybuilding competition because myself, <laughs> I'm not going to put myself through that same thing. So I'm not going to give my she was expertise on that matter because I haven't myself put well, I haven't put myself through that kind of that journey. Yeah. You know? It's cool. the same thing with nutrition. So that, that kind of ties in quite nicely. What what would you say uh, motivates you? What what motivates you to train? What motivates you to be a PT? I just feel better for it. Um, it's the big one for me, you know. Um I have days where I can't make it to the gym and just mentally, especially mental health is a big one for me. Mm. I just feel worse about life, you know, especially on days where I haven't been able to train. Yep. So the big one for me, getting me into the gym and getting moving in general, getting outside, getting outside into nature is a big one for me. Yep. It just makes me in general feel better about myself and feel better about everything. It gives me energy. Um, you know, I have times where I feel like I need to fit a certain mold in terms of what we should look like as personal trainers, um, which leads me into more of the kind of the strength and hypertrophy side of things. But then at the end of the day, I also look at the holistic picture of, okay, well, where do I want to be in 20 years, 50 years? What do I want to be like when I'm retiring? Yeah. You know? Yeah. And, and I think this is something you do really well and potentially why you have clients that stick around with you. I know is why people stick around you. Uh, and and you, I'm sure you bring in business uh, with referrals and with people that just see you around the gym because you're not walking around like a penguin thinking you're a puffed up balloon. You're thinking about how can you smile at every person there and really help them out, you know, and it's not about how much muscle you have or how you look in the exterior, and that goes for life in general, but that goes for with PT as well. If you're that person that's going around the gym, you're jumpy, you're happy, and you're energetic towards just this process of helping people and being able to serve them the best you can, that shows through, and you see it every day with you, and, and it's something that a lot of PTs, I think, uh, leave behind because they're, they're focused on the client that's over there and they won't talk to anyone in that process. And I've been guilty of that myself. Uh, you've got to make sure, and it's, it's, it's hard, right? Because if you're doing 30 hours of, P, of PT and, and these clients are coming in and be like, yeah, I do 40 hours a week, but you're on that every minute and you've got to show up as being happy, alert, you're, you're you know, sure you're counting reps, but there's an awareness around movement, you're talking to them, you know, whatever else is going on. So there's a, a massive amount there and you're trying to show up and be happy for everyone else. <laughs> Yeah, that's the thing. Like, that's where the personal part of personal training comes into it as well. You know, yeah. <clears throat> nobody wants to be around some guy that's just rigid and straight to the point. You know, unless that's the sort of person that they want. Yeah. You know. Um. So yeah, definitely having a smile on your face helps. Making people actually enjoy being at the gym and going, cool. You can have fun and get healthier at the same time. Yeah. You know. Yeah, it may hurt with some muscle soreness along the way, but if you leave the gym with a smile on your face, then that must be a positive thing. Yeah, yeah, and that just comes back to, it's not taking away, it's adding to the quality of life. And by going to the gym, allowing yourself to feel better from those endorphin rushes and, and getting a bit more blood flow around the body and, and getting fit in the process, you're, you're not taking away from your, your life, you're adding to it, because you can show up as a past person you're proud of being and, and able to do the things you want to do. Yeah, and that's what I mean, like, you know, when I'm 80, 90 years old, like I still want to be outside walking around, running up hills and all that sort of stuff as much as I can. Basically. Yeah. Way down the track now, and not gonna happen in between, but that is a goal. You know, it's the longest goal you can kind of aim for. But, and that's really what kind of changed my personal route in terms of my own training styles and stuff from when I first started out. Um, you know, even before I was becoming a PT, I was like, shit, I need to be the biggest guy in the gym. You know, I need to be the strongest guy in the gym. And you just do whatever you can to get to that point. Yeah. And realizing is I actually, there's no long-term benefit for this. It's always going to be a short-term thing. Yeah. Once that finishes, it's like, well, what's next? You know? Yeah. And that's, sort of, that's really what moved me into more of a, shall we say, the holistic side of training and exercise and movement and things. Yeah. I love that, man. That's really cool. Um, so coming back to, your PT and, and the clients you work with, what's the main takeaway that you want 
people, maybe that be a new person coming towards you or clients that have been around you and, and know what you're about, what's the main takeaway that they, you want them to take away from you? Well, I guess it's the same thing as like for me, it's like it's the taking away that it's a long-term thing, yep. you know? So I'm trying to give you tools that you can use throughout your life, which is going to continue to get you healthier or keep you healthy as you move on, you know? They're giving you tools that can work around your lifestyle and things that when things get tough, you know, you have those options or those strategies that can enable you to get it through. Um, yeah, it's kind of the big one for me. Yeah, yeah. People- and I, and it just comes back to the industry. Sorry, say that again. Yeah, just giving people tools for themselves to, you know, get through their own struggles, their own lifestyles and all that sort of stuff as much as they can. Yeah. And um, something as a PT, that as you start to really be there around a lot of time, and I think you kind of averted to this before, was the understanding if you're not working in there with just a direct, like, military-style plan, this is exactly what we're doing. It's like, how's that person showing up today? Are they stressed? Are they tired? What's going on in their life that's going to stop them from really being able to perform, right? And you're coming in with a new level of um, expertise, obviously, by seeing that and what that really does to people and being able to shift those workouts and make those adjustments along the way. Yeah. Well, that's the thing. Like, I've had times where I've turned up to a session and asked the client how they've been getting on they've said to me they're shattered they're sore they're tired with this that and the other I'm like go home they're like oh no 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 I'm good you know it's just like well if that's the way you're feeling anything we do now is just going to impact on that more yeah you know I'm probably going to send you more in the opposite direction than the forward thinking you know in the forward direction that we want to be yeah yeah and that's something that the industry in general is, is showing through right like it's uh, that's something that potentially is quite a negative towards fitness industry because it's the same the whole goal is like what's the new new pre-workout what's the new thing that gives us energy so we can go crush it we can go train and and it's like well if you look at that bigger picture and if that you know for you as a pt that's where your value lies is being able to stand back and go look this is where you're at right now and this is the best logical step for you and your efforts moving forward but it's such a big part of the industry that we're trying to shift as as intelligent pts trying to make sure there's a focus around what we can improve with the results and then with the tools I have. And if you come in with, uh, you, like you said, you're stressed, you're tired and you're overworked, your ability to perform on that day is not very high. So maybe I'll do a, do a bit of movement with them. I'll do some stretching. I'll do some general stuff because they've been, like you said, sitting down too much throughout the day. But generally there's no point going through and doing your heavy squats that were just planned for that day just because you think by being a robot, robot and ticking off that list is actually going to help you. Yeah, yeah. Um, <clears throat> and that's the thing, like, Again, it always comes back down to the awareness and things. Yeah. Like our job with PTs is to teach, right, and get people to figure, or help give them, um, help them figure out the equation so they can get to the answer themselves. Yeah. Of going, okay, well, if my body is feeling like this, this, and this. Then today, can we do something different? Yeah. You know? Can we change it up slightly because of this, this, and this? Rather than going. Well, I know exercise is good for me. High intensity stuff is good for me. Then let's do high intensity stuff. You know? Yeah, it's and funny you bring that one up, actually. I, I, let me know if you've seen this, but I find that the guys that are working at a high, high guys or girls working at a high level and they're, they're you know, corporate level or they're, they're just used to go, 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 go all day. And that's why they like high intensity because they're just sticking with where they're, they're comfortable. Whereas the guy that, that comes in and he's just stretching and he's doing yoga, he's probably like just super chilled out with his life. The best thing he can do is get into that, that high intensity state, right? So it's this ability and awareness, and and from your your knowledge to know where to put them. If they're always high, how can we get them down and really slow things down, and get movement? And if they're always low and chilled out, how can we get them high and able to get to that state of high performance? Yeah, yeah, and um, comes down to preferences as well, and working with the client in terms of okay, okay, well that's the stuff you enjoy. Then yeah, we can do some of it, but we just won't do it for the duration that you normally would. Mm. Yeah, and it's again starting off that light stuff first, and be like, cool. Then we'll finish with a little bit of high intensity work. Um, because we, yeah, good. Yeah, I've got a question for you here. This is one that I, I'd be interested to know your answer for. Is when do you stop listening to what they like? <laughs> oh, to be honest, a lot of my clients don't like anything in the gym. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, okay, that's a good start. But it's that understanding of like, this is a fine line. I think you know it is is. Uh, you know, being able to shift them into training phases that they know they're going to get the most value from, but also making sure that it's not just where they're always comfortable, right? 
yeah and that's the thing that's where the teaching part comes in it's like what is the why behind why we're doing this you know and that's one that helps a lot of people is once they can understand the reasoning behind they need to be doing something that's when they tend to move into it or be a little bit more open towards it then they start enjoying it more and so they do it themselves more and then that's when you find that other avenue it's like cool now that you're doing that thing by yourself what's mm -hmm. another area that we can start to try and open up yeah so when people come in and tell you they want to put a bit, build a bit of muscle or they want to lose a bit of fat we know that's bullshit right what's what's the why that you find is actually there do you know what for a lot of my clients that don't actually have that deep down <clears throat> that deep why but for a lot of people it's just feel better about themselves yeah. you, know? you know it may take them a week to figure it out it may take them a whole year but eventually it all comes down to I just want to feel better yeah. and it takes them themselves to realize that it's not always the aesthetic goal that will get them to that feeling. You know, I have clients that end up going, well, no, I didn't lose as much weight that I wanted, but I'm stronger and fitter. I feel happier about everything. I've got more energy throughout the day. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, they always come to do right. You can, uh, you, and you, obviously, you can have the same with business where you you have the fancy car, you have the fancy house, but you still feel miserable. It's the same if you rock up with abs and you you're shredded, but if you feel terrible, you still haven't achieved that goal. It's just that ne next level of fulfillment, knowing that with your training, you're moving forward and you're able to be that person you want to be. Yeah, yeah. And sometimes it takes, like I say, like sometimes it takes a client a week to realize it. Sometimes it takes them a year. Yeah. But eventually, on their own journey, they figure it out along the way. Is that we actually yeah. That was a little bit, a little bit silly to say that that's my actual goal. But if that's something that we can achieve, then it's something that we can achieve. But if you, you know, if you give them the right direction, give them the right tools, give them the right information, all that, you know, looking good, losing weight stuff, that that's kind of a byproduct. You know, mm -hmm. if you can just focus on getting them moving, getting them stronger, getting them eating healthier, eventually those other goals come up get you know checked off yeah and actually you know that next level awareness and it's that balance between what they want to achieve and what they think they need to achieve and what they actually want to achieve and sometimes we can see that but how much do you allow that to happen and be like cool we're just going to achieve this goal and then we'll think about the next one that you really want to achieve once you get there or do you find a way to kind of help them through that path to look a little deeper and maybe find a deeper way always trying to find a deeper way yeah. um you know like again, always coming back to myself. I had those goals of wanting to build muscle and all that sort of stuff, try to get bigger, you know, get shredded and things. But then it was like, well, why? You know, I'm not competing, I'm not trying to win any girls over outside of the gym and all that sort of stuff. So never gonna be strutting down the beach. So what is my why behind doing it? And it's like, well, Actually, I feel better when I do this style of training. Well, I feel better when I'm just doing a generalized kind of a little bit of this, a little bit of that, a little bit of this, you know? <clears throat> and it's trying to get clients to <clears throat> figure that out on their own. And you just take what they are, you know, you listen to how they talk, how they feel about what they've been doing. And you just make kind of little adjustments. Be like, oh, well, last week you said this. You know what's changed you know and then from them looking at you know their progress at the gym you know you see them talking more about oh i'm getting stronger and stuff like this their body composition may not change but they're not unhappy you go well, hey your original goal was to lose weight but that hasn't been changing but you're getting stronger and you feel happy about that you know and you just have those sort of little conversations and eventually they go well actually you know i'm not too worried about the weight that things are a bonus, but if we can focus now on these, 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 you know, sweet. Just in the course of, you know, a couple of weeks training, all yeah. those stuff, you start to make their own choice of actually none. Yeah, it's probably a little bit silly and it's probably just off the top of my head that weight loss was a goal, but really, you know, I want to be able to do pull-ups. I want to be able to do this, that, the other.
Yeah. And I think there's a balance again there that you've got to be careful with, isn't there? Because one, are they just saying that they want to get strong because they find that losing the weight they need to lose is hard? Or do they not, are they not uncomfortable enough to need to lose that, right? Because if, if they're just allowing that weight to go up, and this is where, you know, you start to see a bit of a movement on Instagram and all sorts of stuff where, you know, love your body. Yeah, that's great. But if you're 30 kilos overweight and that's a, an infect, like getting in the way of you living your life, you can't run after, you, you won't run around with your kids and, and be in a position that you can do that as activities you want to do, then yes, you need to lose that weight. You need to realize that pain is there and stopping you from doing what you're doing to be that man. But uh, at the same time, if you're, if you're in that position, and you're just choosing a goal for the same goal, now you're starting to, re- and you start to reflect on that, you realize you don't have a why behind it, and there might have been something else you wanted to achieve, right? So it's, it's, it's a balancing act between, uh, do you actually want that goal, or have you just been told that that's probably what you should do, or is it something that you can see in your own life, and it becomes bigger than you? It's that big enough why, as you keep coming back to it, which I love, which is the understanding that's bigger than yourself, and it allows a, a better reflection of your life on the people around you, because you're not held back by your weight or your strength or, or whatever other aspect you can improve in the gym. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. So after obviously a good four years of training and six plus years of working through this industry, um, what are one of the things that you aim to change uh, or, or you know, that you want to adjust people's views on about the fitness industry and getting in good shape? <clears throat> I think we're still fighting through that whole, you know, the silver bullet, right? everything comes back to everybody wants that one way of doing things. Yeah. And I, you know, a lot of top influences out there, <clears throat> they have vested interests in people going in a certain direction. And I feel like as trainers, like we're still trying to fight against those people, you know? Um, so the big one that I, I just want people to be more open about their training, about their nutrition, and that there is no one way to do things. And it's a shame that, again, like come back to, you know, there's abundance of information out there that shows that there is no one way and that, you know, you can gain muscle of doing strength training, hypertrophy training, or even endurance training, you know, but there's still people that go nuts. Nah, nah, this is the one way that we need to be doing it. They're emotionally attached to it, right? And then, and this comes, I guess, maybe one part's awareness, but they start to see progress with one way of training, but because they've only learned one way and they haven't exposed themselves to how much breadth of knowledge there is out there, and, and knowing that they can question those paths, uh, you know, it's, it's human nature to just keep finding more shit that reinforces what you already know. And once you start to see that depth and, and being able to know, I can actually do this other, another way and really enjoy it or do it without banging up my joints or, or whatever else, then it puts you in a better position to realize that you can shift that path, you can shift your way of training. And it's not just writing in your, in your journal that you put on 0.25 weight on, you can actually find a new way to feel more mobile, stronger and enjoy what you're doing and still make those same strength games or, or same progress in your training. And, and that's, yeah. <clears throat> yeah, that, yeah. That's the thing, like people go, they lock into a specific program or a specific type of diet and go like, okay, no, this is what I need to be doing because X, Y, and Z did it. Yeah. You know? It's that whole idea of keeping up with the Joneses. Well, I want what they have. So I need to do what they're doing. Mm. But that's just not the way that, you know, especially for this, this industry works, you know, everything is so open. <clears throat> and that's something that I had to learn quite quickly you know, through training people and through my own studies is going, well, actually, what I get taught, there's probably a bunch of information that counteracts that, you know? Yeah, you can always find an argument for something. Uh, and also at the same time, right? Like if you've got long arms, you've got a flat sternum uh, and whatever else, and structurally, you, you're going to move very differently to that person that's, you know, Samoan with a massive sternum angle and short, you know, powerful levers, right? There's just going to, he's going to look great doing a bench press regardless of, whether he knows he's doing it right. And if you go try to do that same movement and, and bounce off your chest or you know, not even be aware of what's happening in your back, you have no level of skill acquisition and, and level of awareness that needs to be taken account or even the range that you should maybe alter because of your structure that stops you from getting injured or, or allows you to make the same gains they did. So you know, it happens a lot with the bodybuilding side is these guys look great and then I want to look like them, but if they're a completely different structure or even maybe just 10 years down the line from you, right now there's a whole new level of skill acquisition and awareness that comes into that process and also knowing are you even close to the same structure and do you have the ability of moving the same way as them or being able to feel the muscle the way they do and the answer is probably no you need to know that 
there's a process you need to go down and, and a process of acquiring that skill at each part of that, that timeline to be able to feel like you can move forward. And it comes back to that through and through, right? Find someone that knows where you're at right now. Find someone who can give you those skills at the point you're at so that you can build that skill moving forward. You can build a, an ability to, to know the things you need to focus on right now rather than looking at the perfect wall without really knowing how to put down that first brick. And that's the thing, like when it comes down to the, our jobs as trainers to take all that information that's out there and how do we apply it to our individual client, you know? I'm not sure what it was like with yourself, you know, coming through the studies, but kind of get taught that there is a textbook way to do certain exercises, Yeah. you know? And the fact that that's still around is something that needs to change as well. It's like, yeah, yeah there is a say a principal movement that we want to follow, but how each individual does that movement is going to be so varied that that needs to be the thing that's taught. Yeah, yeah. And you can see the, you can see the textbook traded pretty quickly, can't you? <laughs> yeah. yeah. So it's trying to make sure, yeah, I think that that one point you made is, is probably the big, best um, point so far is really, uh, and it keeps coming back to the information piece, like stop looking for more information. More information doesn't help you. It's those one to two steps right now that you need to make that really moves you forward. And whether you need, you can see them yourselves and you think you can go on that alone, then good on you. But try find a way to have someone in your corner that can look at that without the emotional attachment, the way you're training, eating or, or generally doing shit so that they can really move you forward and know that that path isn't so dogmatic and one way approached that if you're stuck, you know that you can shift it. And there's so many other ways that you could do. And there's an abundance of things you could do but there needs to be those one or two things that allows you to actually put action and steps uh, and those steps in place. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and again, that's comes down to our job, you know, as trainers <clears throat> is to figure that kind of path out. It's like, where is their starting point? Where do they want to get to? And then how do we do that? Yeah, absolutely. Cool, man. So I want to, I want to uh, ask you an interesting question on this one around, um, you know, you've had a good a couple of years to question the industry. You've had a good couple of years to realize people's habits and potentially how they sabotage themselves. Um, but coming through that industry and, and seeing your own learnings through that, um, it'd be interesting to know what advice would you give to, to your younger self? Say you're 21, you're coming through this industry, you're starting to try tackle this process of one, feeling great in your own body, but being able to help other people go through this. Uh, what would your, your advice be there? Uh... Oh, that's actually a good one. Haven't had a chance to think about that at all, to be honest. You're too um, busy going, 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 right? <laughs> yeah. Shit, put me on the spot, why don't you? No, well, I think the big one for you is, uh, and as we started, the conversation was around just you're continually learning and that process I, I keep seeing with, uh, this is a question I love from Tim Ferriss. He's always asking these guys that are going through this process of, you know, where would they, what would they tell to the younger self and what are the biggest lessons that they learned? And a lot of this stuff comes down to one, it's like chill out and enjoy the process, but two, make sure that you realize you don't know everything right now. And when you're a young buck, you seem to just, you have that one way and you dive after it without any questioning your beliefs, but it's starting to look a little deeper into, uh, you know, what can we, what can we really learn along the way? Who can we learn from that's going to move us forward and then just chill out and enjoy the ride? Yeah. Yeah, well, I guess in that terms is that would be the big one is just, again, be open, you know. For example, when I first started out, especially around my mental health and things, use that as the best example. I got told about meditation. Yep. You know, meditation is really good for kind of easing the mind, letting yourself kind of center yourself. And I was like, no, no, no. <laughs> meditation, meditation is like hippie. It's all BS, you know. It's just a bunch of theories and all those sorts of things. Till it got to the point where I'd done everything else but meditation. It's like, well, fuck it, might as well give this a try. And you're like, oh shit. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And that's the thing. It's like be open to every experience that you can so you yourself know what it feels like. And you go, cool, did this work for me? Did it not? You know? So I definitely would go. Yeah, yeah. Cool. I think especially in New Zealand as well, potentially that's a, a macho thing that they're still taking their time to overcome. Um, but it's definitely something that, you know, if you're training your body all day and you're putting that time aside to build muscle or drop the body fat or just generally be better physically, if you're not taking any time and investing time into your, your mental capacity and training that, uh, you're wasting your fucking time because you can't change your body without changing that mind in the process. And if you can be aware of your breathing, 
uh, and how how much it affects your diaphragm and the tightness in your back and your overall just clarity of thoughts, you start to realize how much this stuff intertwines. And if you can focus in on how that muscle moves, how you're breathing through that exercise, and generally uh, how that stress throughout the day is causing you to potentially breathe differently, tighten up, or whatever else, you start to look at, at this whole nother level of awareness, which is, you know, you've said, the, we've said both the whole way through this conversation, which I really, really like, but it just, there's new levels of it when you start to bring in the mindset training and, and how much that plays a massive part right into the physical. Yeah, yeah, well, that's the thing, right? Was it, I think one of Tim Ferriss's quotes is about, you know, we only use kind of 60%. We always feel it when it comes to exercise and movement or whatever, you only use 60% of your energy, right? You still got another 40% that you can kind of push yourself through. Yeah. And that's the part we don't focus on <clears throat> enough as well. I find myself like trying to teach clients more about the mental side of things. You know, as you say, it's just as important as the physical. You know? Yeah. No, uh, we take these barriers up for ourselves because we think, no, no, this is where my limitation is. It's like, well, that's just your brain protecting you. All right. And we don't change when we stay in our little bubble. Yeah. You know? Cool. Yeah. No, that's really, really cool. And then obviously, that was the main reason I got you on this call is is making sure and obviously connecting with you is because I realized there was so much more to the physical there and uh, you seem to get that. You seem to be one of the few in the industry, especially in Wellington at least, uh, that are promoting that. You're being very vulnerable and you're opening up your own stories and your own your own path, which is really great, which obviously for you brings a whole other level of connection with the people around you and then the clients that work with you because you're very true about where you're at in that process and you're learning and you're growing as you, as you go through that, uh, both mentally and physically. Uh, and, and it just brings a whole new level, which is really cool. So, um, you know, thanks so much for coming on the podcast and being able to go through this process and learn and, and, and talk with me about uh, these concepts that, that can really apply to everyone and bring a whole new level of, of clarity and, and awareness as we keep bringing um, to the way they train. Is there anything else you'd like to say there? Nah, man, just cheers for having me on. It's always good to have a yarn with someone else that's in the industry, you know, rather than trying to have a little bit of a headbutt conversation with a couple of clients, but, you know, just been able to split little ideas and things it's been it's been good but yeah like we say we always come back to it. it's awareness and being holistic with everything you know there is not one way to do things and not everything is individual it's all at the end of the day intertwined yeah. absolutely man awesome all right thank you very much for coming on board uh, and we'll talk again soon yeah looking forward to it cool see you later cheers Ollie.